If we can uh, ask people to come in from the foyer, please. The chimers, yeah, where, where's our chimers? We need our con shell from Hawaii. <laughs> Okay, in the interest of time, we're ready to go. I'm going to teach you one Hawaiian word. I am uh, Loretta Diliana Fuddy. I'm the state health official from the state of Hawaii. And in the morning, we say aloha kakiaka. Good morning to you. Aloha kakiaka. Aloha. <laughs> Wonderful. First lesson in Hawaiian. <laughs> um, uh, welcome to our Thursday keynote session. Uh, as we all know, significant savings can be realized in terms of life, health, and health care costs if we boldly address obesity, and especially if we begin in the early years and with children. Working in partnership with USDA, its child nutrition programs, state and federal leaders can enact policy and programmatic changes that can make a difference, and a big difference. Food Nutrition Service oversees a Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, formerly known as the Food Stamp Program, which serves over 44 million Americans each month. Child nutrition programs include national school lunch, school breakfast, and summer food service programs, the child and adult care food program, the special supplemental nutrition program for women and children, WIC, the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, and other nutrition programs, um, quite an array of services. We are extremely privileged to have today with us uh, the Undersecretary for Food Nutrition Services speaking and sharing his thoughts with us this morning. Kevin Concannon was nominated by President Obama and Secretary Vaslick um, and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in July of 2009 to serve as Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition, Consumer Services in the United States Department of Agriculture. Undersecretary Concannon has had a lengthy and distinguished career in public service. Over the past 25 years, he has served as Director of State Health and Human Services Departments in Maine, Oregon, and Iowa. He has championed expanded services, improved access, alternatives to institutions, consumer choice, affordable health care, diversity in workplace and programs, and modernization of public information technology systems. Undersecretary Concannon will discuss how federal and state leaders can work together to improve child nutrition through reforms through school lunch and breakfast programs, SNAP, and WIC, as the nation implements the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act. So please put a warm welcome together for Undersecretary Concannon. Thank you very much. It is a very special honor to be here with you today. I actually had several television interviews earlier this morning at a, a center that serves, uh, uh, serves as a food pantry for some of the populations in the city here. But they asked me, why are you here? And I said, well, I'm here for a number of reasons, but one of the most important is this opportunity to speak with uh, the nation's public health leaders that are meeting here from across the country. So uh, I very much appreciate the fact that uh, you've given me this invitation. We have uh, 
Uh, we depend upon you uh, state to state across the country. Actually, just before I came here, I visited an Austin City Community Service Center that, among other functions, serves as a WIC center and saw lots of moms with their very young children, some pregnant women that were lined up there waiting for services. And uh, I know in almost every state in the country, the health department uh, operates the WIC program. We very much appreciate that. Well, it's my pleasure to be here with all of you. And our goal at the Food and Nutrition Service within the USDA is to ensure that all Americans, whatever their age, have access to healthy and nutritious foods that will help them to live but also thrive and be healthy. This fall, the, tomorrow I'll be visiting public schools here in this area, and earlier this week I was over in Florida visiting schools because we are on the verge of, where actually we're implementing the first major changes in school meals in more than 15 years. And we're very excited about uh, the potential the impact that that is going to have on American children and ultimately American adults. Uh, we're promoting something called the School Day Just Got Healthier to really elevate public awareness of those changes that are occurring in the nation's schools. Since many American children consume half their meals in schools, we're working in partnership with the states because everything we do in the Food and Nutrition Service, we do through state agencies, whether it's the Human Service Agency, the Education Agency, the Health Agency, and in a few states, the Agriculture Agency are the partnership agencies at the state level. One of our most significant accomplishments, and I'm very pleased with the fact that it also represented a bipartisan effort in Congress, was the enactment of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010. And within that act is embedded a number of major changes uh, in the nutrition programs that we oversee, and the most important of which are those changes in the school meals program. It is the first changes in the nutrition requirements in more than 15 years, and they are really significant changes. The dietary standards that are within the, the new meal program reflect the dietary guidelines for all Americans, and they were built, that is the meal standards, built on recommendations from the Institute of Medicine. The committee that we work with on that was chaired by a pediatrician from Penn, and uh, she did an outstanding job. Schools for the past few weeks, depending on where you are in the country, how long they have been open. But by and large, in most of the country, we're receiving, and in most schools, to be sure, we're receiving very positive impact associated with it. What do these meal standards do? They ensure that students are offered fruits and vegetables every day of the week. This is a first, every day of the week. It increases the offerings of whole grain foods. It offers only fat-free or low-fat, 1% milk. It limits calories, listen to this. Uh, the, the National School Lunch Program was started in 1946, after World War II. And it has had, throughout its, its history, minimum calorie requirements, but those same minimum calorie requirements were the same for kindergartners or high school students, and there were no maximum calories. I recall going to a school in the Midwest a year or so ago, and as I walked through the school line with some fourth graders, they were serving enough meatballs on these hoagies really to handle, you know, a couple of sumo wrestlers, I think. <laughs> and uh, so this year, for the first time, we have maximum calorie requirements, age adjusted. K through five, grades six to eight, and then high school students. We also, it increases the focus on reducing the amounts of saturated fat, trans fats, added sugars, and sodium. The standards went into effect July 1st. Many schools were already at or well on their way. I know states like Texas already had certain state requirements in terms of, uh, terms of school meals that really have, have moved along the the, the most positive kind of line. Well, the standards that apply to the National School Lunch Program are effective immediately uh, for lunch. The standards for breakfast, with the exception of the milk standard, will be phased in over the next three years. Each day, 32 million American children participate in the National School Lunch Program. That's in 100,000 public schools and in half of the private and parochial schools in the United States. 
about 12 million children have breakfast at school. So these schools that will apply, that apply, all will be required with these new standards will receive the first reimbursement beyond, reimbursement increase beyond inflation in 25 years. So uh, it offers additional resources, but uh, this is a pretty significant change. Part of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, and this is where I really relish the opportunity to talk with you, requires that schools strengthen their local wellness policies. I work with a lot of state agencies, a lot of agencies that are associated with the nutrition side of the house, but it, often the nutrition directors will tell me, they told me this in Bradenton, Florida here just this week, we can deliver on the nutrition side, but the wellness side, meaning the exercise side, you know, we have to have additional help to persuade school administrators to make sufficient time for physical education, to make sufficient time for kids to actually eat the meal, not to rush through it, and to promote activity for at all levels in the school. And that's really where you all can help, public health agencies, physicians, nurses, all of you on the health side can really bolster uh, the support that is needed by these school administrators to really make the commensurate improvements in the wellness side of the house that we're making on the nutrition side. So uh, I really urge you as the state public health authority, state to state, to really get engaged if you're not, I'm sure if many of you already are directly so, but to the extent that you can keep promoting that. I've been struck by as I travel around the country, I was on an Indian reservation in northern Minnesota and tribal official as a yellow bus came by, he said, you know, even here, when those kids get off those yellow buses, they go right in the house, they don't come out. They get on their computers, their Xboxes, or they watch television, they don't exercise. And you hear the same thing in cities. Uh, you hear it from one end of the country to the other. And of course, that's part of the equation. That's part of the challenge we have around obesity. So uh, very much would appreciate your help on that front. We have a program, as was mentioned in that, introduction, you know, the federal government were addicted to, uh, to acronyms, and so you have to kind of know the lexicon of letters, but we have something called a CACFP program, the Child and Adult Care Feeding Program. This is largely targeted at children and child care, but a portion of it also goes to adult day centers. I visited one of each uh, in Florida earlier this week, and uh, particularly on the, on the child care side, uh, we are, again, we have received recommendations from the Institute of Medicine to improve the meal requirements in child care, not only child care centers, but child care homes across the country. And we want to build on that because many of you know firsthand through your operation of the WIC program, two, a year ago last October, every state in the country and the district uh, districts as well implemented a new meal pattern in the WIC program. Well, WIC serves about 53% of all the births in the United States. And in Texas, I think it's 63% of all of the births. And we have states in the room here where it's an even higher percentage. But more than 53% of the births, 53% of the kids, infants in the first year of life, WIC serves them, a prescriptive, uh, preventive health program in the form of a focus on nutrition, nutrition education, and health care. And uh, we introduced that new meal pattern based on, again, recommendations from the Institute of Medicine. Well, we hired that same Institute of Medicine to make recommendations to us for the child care program because we have that gap. We go from, from when children are involved in WIC to when they enter school now with a new meal pattern, we have that gap in between where the, the nutrition may not be so healthy. So we're very anxious to move forward with that. It awaits uh, getting some additional help from, uh, from uh, the Congress uh, as well as the administration. We are also uh, working with HRSA and some of the other federal agencies. Uh, I had the good fortune to meet with uh, some of you from the Mid-Atlantic uh, area here recently, the health directors uh, in Washington. We're very anxious to connect even better with the public health agencies across the country. You know, WIC is a terrific program. It's doing great things. But uh, I've been struck when I've talked with my, some folks at HRSA 
and agencies out in the field that, as strange as it may seem, we have disconnections at times between the FQACs, the Federally Qualified Health Centers, and WIC. We could better connect them. Uh, somebody told me that, that the FQHCs are involved in about between 500 and 550,000 births a year, while the WIC program is involved with more than 2 million. So I think there are some additional opportunities for us to link up on that front. And any thoughts you have along that line, we'd be more than willing and very open to it. What's our goal in all of this? To make sure that, again, uh, Americans have access routinely, not occasionally, routinely to, to healthy eating, nutrition, sound nutrition. We're in the middle of an obesity crisis. And the way in which we got the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, it was, it was a major achievement to, to get that major piece of legislation through. We're very proud, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it reflected a bipartisan effort. And while we had the American Academy of Pediatrics and family practice docs and public health physicians, nurses, nutritionists, others, we also had a group of retired generals and admirals. There are about 200 retired American generals and admirals that have formed a 501c3 corporation called Mission Readiness in the terminology of, 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 of the military. And the reason they for, found this, formed this and have really been champions with us and remain so is 27% of American young people between the ages of 17 and 24 are ineligible for military service based on being so overweight alone. That one criterion, 27%. And recently I was on a panel with uh, the, the head of the CDC, the, the uh, chief uh, Howard Coe, the assistant secretary for health, and uh, a physician who's in charge of all the active treatment army hospitals, not the VA, army and military generally. And he pointed out a statistic, the general, that 24% of the military, active military, uh, are not allowed to re-up because they can't maintain their weight. And he said, just go in any American military base, you'll see a whole string of, uh, of fast food restaurants. So they presented this to Congress as, hey, this isn't just a nice thing to do. This is something we really need to pay attention to in terms of national security. But also, uh, this bill, when we were advocating it, followed on the heels of that very contentious debate about health care costs associated with the enactment of the Affordable Care Act. And we said, hey, we're talking about preventable conditions here to the extent that we can inculcate in Americans and start right out with them uh, with young children and their parents eating healthier. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in New Orleans eat, eating at a table, a round table like one of these, a uh, little lower, closer to the floor, with a bunch of first graders uh, in the very first week of school. And uh, it was a school that was just rebuilt. It was totally underwater during uh, Katrina. And as I was sitting next to this little girl, first grader, uh, eating with those kids, she leaned over and looked at my plate and said, sir, if you don't finish your broccoli, I'll eat the rest of it for you. <laughs> and I thought, man, this is a good sign of progress. Uh, that, that the kids are, again, being socialized into healthier eating. And when I was in Sarasota, uh, day before yesterday, I went through the breakfast line at a school where, in that school, 98%, it was the poorest school in that community, 98% of the kids are free and reduced price. That's the metric we use to, to assess the, the level of impoverishment of school populations, 98% of these kids. And the kids ahead of me were taking the fruit, and they, were, they had sliced apples in those little plastic bags, sliced up, which kids will eat versus the whole apple. And, uh, but they also had the little half cups of, of peaches, but then they all had color, the green and, and uh, reddish color. And I saw the kids reaching in, taking those greens. It was like a Kelly green color. So I asked the nutrition director, I said, what is that green stuff? And she said, that's, that's applesauce. And I said, green applesauce? She said, we put a little bit of jello in it just to give it the color. Well, to me, this was an example of, of uh, some of the work that has been done by uh, Brian Wansuck and some of the folks up at Cornell 
that you just add a few variations on this that attract the child to it. Just adding an adjective to describe, you know, these are, these are sumptuous potatoes. Or <laughs> that may not do it, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but adding, in other words, as we keep saying, let's make the right choice the easy choice for folks. And uh, uh, I, as I travel around, uh, again, I, I'm very excited about the fact that this is really taking hold. And one of the ways in which we convey our, in a very simple way with kids, what we're trying to get them to achieve, as I saw the handout on, on many of the, the chairs here, the My Plate. My Plate, you know, as I say, we, we had the food pyramid for many, many years, but it brought me back to, you know, uh, a calculus class almost to, to understand it for me. So uh, we say the My Plate is a much more actionable, much more understandable icon to convey to kids that, that uh, make half your plate fruits and vegetables. And uh, I've seen it in schools, many we're promoting it with schools across the country, promoting it in WIC clinics, promoting it in food banks where I started the morning today as well to just reinforce that we can eat healthier if we just are more conscious uh, of what we're doing and uh, don't fill up the, the plate with uh, so many processed foods that really are what's, what have gotten so many of us in trouble. We are, the SNAP program, I wanna mention that as well, or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, as was mentioned, we have record numbers of people in this country dependent upon the program, 46 million plus people at last count. And uh, the, uh, about half of that number, about 48% are children. Uh, it reflects, again, the status of the American economy. I'm staying in this hotel, as most of you are, and I'm always mindful when I stay in a hotel these days. Are the folks who make the beds, are the folks who serve the meals, uh, are they getting sufficient number of hours over the course of the week to be able to handle their, their mortgage or their rent or uh, the other obligations that they have as a family? And unfortunately, not enough Americans are having that opportunity. So the SNAP program, or the supplemental, it's by design, the first word is supplemental, is intended to be responsive to that. And about while we have record increases in it, about 65% of that increase is directly attributable. It's an arithmetic relationship to the economy, to the workforce situation, to the jobs that have been created, mainly service jobs for too many people, and not sufficient to re help them meet their obligations. So. When I, uh, when I look at those numbers, I'm very mindful of that, but I'm also very mindful in this state, for example, HEB is, uh, is a high quality chain of supermarkets, and the vice president of HEB said, you know, we're very fortunate to have, <coughs> excuse me, the SNAP program here, because see those hourly workers going by us in the store? We wouldn't be able to employ as many of them if we didn't have the food stamp program. And in Texas, it's now, serving close to three and a half million people in Florida where I was, close to four million people. Again, reflecting two thirds of that increase, reflecting the economy. A third of it reflecting policy changes that we've made. And I'm very proud of those. I know there are people who are trying to toss grenades at, at that issue, but I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the, the program is working as it should and that it is an option for people. There's no reason, there's no defensible reason why Americans should go hungry with our capacity to produce food. So, we are now looking forward to, with our partners, by the way, the Dietary Guidelines and the My Plate is a, is a joint effort, uh, the Dietary Guidelines with the Department of Health and Human Services. And every five years, we promulgate those Dietary Guidelines. Well, we're already working on the Dietary Guidelines for 2015. We were the lead federal agency for 2010 <clears throat> our colleagues at HHS are the lead agency for 2015. But I know I've heard from some of you and from some of the other healthcare medical organizations nationally, the dietary guidelines for all Americans start at age two. They're two through the life course. There is no s current recommendations around from, from either HHS or FNS around uh, uh, birth to age two. And we have jointly made a commitment, uh, the two federal agencies, for the next round, for the 2015, the 2015 
guidelines will be released and then subsequently we will be releasing guidelines for infant for birth to age two so we'll be addressing a gap that has existed there isn't as much science there that's been part of the hesitation on moving forward but we know uh, it creates a number of issues we really appreciate uh, the opportunity for uh, public health entities across the country to promote the My Plate or Mi Plato uh, in the Hispanic or Latino populations. Uh, again, we have huge challenges in the country around obesity. We can't do it alone. We don't propose to do it alone, but we know people pay attention to what you and your agencies uh, say and advocate for. And uh, again, uh, we appreciate the partnership to work with you. Uh, we look forward to especially continue our work with you on WIC, but uh, in a broader sense on the wellness programs with schools. We, we would really love to connect even better in that regard because uh, uh, you are, you, you'll have a more powerful voice uh, than, than the nutrition side alone. So thanks for what you do and thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you, um, Under Secretary Kunkan, and I think uh, you gave us a lot to to look forward to uh, opportunities to um, look at promoting healthy nutrition and physical activity. Before we get into the question and answer period, I thought I would take some time to share with you what we're doing in Hawaii to implement the very kinds of things that were just discussed related to the wellness guidelines, SNAPED, and WIC. Uh, so. In Hawaii, we have uh, one school district, so that puts us at great, dis great advantage. We have one Department of Health and one school district. We're the 10th largest school district in the nation. Um, and we have partnered with our Department of Education to implement the safety and wellness surveys um, to all of the pr principals once a year. We're also working with them to monitor the compliance with the DOE wellness guidelines and we meet the requirements for the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act um, under Section 204. In addition to utilizing USDA funds, we've been fortunate to be able to leverage um, some of our tobacco settlement money uh, for the promotion of wellness and nutrition. So we have uh, funded nine health and PE resource teachers to support standard-based physical um, education across the state. So again, it's not just about food intake, it's about all that exercise and, and moving out there. Um, we have trained between uh, 2011 and 2012, 550 DOE faculty and staff on, on physical activities. In addition to working with the Department of Education, we want to have a broader reach. So we're also working with the charter schools and some of the private schools. We created a healthy school award and um, we give out small grants and this is an opportunity to work with them to look at implementing good physical, um, good nutrition and physical activity. And finally, um, in the area of training, we have partnered not only with Department of Education, but our University of Hawaii, because we think it's important that the, the faculty at the schools really understand the nutritional pieces. So looking at creating a healthy school nutrition environment we also have trained the actual cafeteria staff and provided an opportunity for them to be creative. Because as you say, um, we're serving more fruits and vegetables um, in the schools. Department of Education has done away with all of their fryers. Department of Education has agreed that their vending machines will no longer have soda. Uh, so they're doing some great things. But what, we, what we're hearing from them is that children often see the food, it doesn't look good to them, they haven't experienced it, um, so they toss it. So we need to be more creative on our recipe design, and so we're helping them with looking at incorporating more um, whole grain baked goods and entrees um, from, from scratch. And then the, the uh, SNAP-Ed program, again, we're trying to get a reach beyond the Department of Education. So since 2006, the Department of Health um, has implemented the SNAP-Ed program. Um, our focus in this area has been with the uh, YMCAs and looking at the after-school programs. So uh, we worked with them and um, implemented the Harvard School of Public Health Food and Fun program, 
uh, for all of their uh, after school and morning programs. We're also looking at the young child, because I think as, as um, Under Secretary mentioned, it's important to look at the early years. So from grade uh, K to six, we're looking at a curriculum for them as well. Uh, and working with our preschools, Department of Human Services um, does the licensing for the preschools, but we're working with them to come up with a package that will promote um, good physical activity and nutrition and obesity prevention. During the summer, we uh, help fund an intercession cooking and nutrition education camp with, uh, for teens. Um, the Undersecretary also mentioned the community health centers. Um, we do a lot with our community health centers in Hawaii. It's one way to address um, health inequities. And we are working with one community to do a social marketing campaign. And finally, we, are look, we have um, collaborated with the city and with the community health centers and the YMCA to promote the EBT and Double Bucks incentive programs at the farmer's market. And then WIC, of course, one of the mainstays for us uh, for um, children and pregnant women. Hawaii has a population of about 1.2 million. Um, we've increased uh, quite substantially our, our WIC reach. It used to be about um, 35,000. It's now closer to 40,000, uh, 40, which is about 40% of the births. Uh, we do partner with our, our federally qualified health centers. The majority of our WIC programs are administered through the community health centers, and we provide um, the oversight. We are um, looking at the changing, again, to the new CDC growth, gui gui growth grids for children zero to two. Um, and we are promoting breastfeeding. It's one of the main, major pieces for not only healthy nutrition, but prevention of obesity. Uh, we have uh, a CDC era grant looking at promotion of the Baby Friendly Project. The Kaiser Permanente Hospital has received the Baby Friendly designation we are working with 80% of our birthing hospitals at this point, and three more are on their way. Of course, education is important, so we are also providing education to the hospital staff on 10 steps to successful breastfeeding and then doing master um, training programs. We also have um, breastfeeding peer educators that we work with. And then just a new area for us, uh, Hawaii does not have fluoridated water, so congratulations to, to Portland in passing um, their Fluoridation Act. Uh, so we have one of the highest carry rates. And we felt that the WIC program was an ideal partnership um, with our community health centers. So we piloted a project in one small part of the island, uh, Kona, on the big island of Hawaii, and um, the Dentists and hygienists come in to the WIC clinic and they do the actual screening of the children and provide um, topical fluoride. And we referred about 23% of those children on to treatment um, in conjunction with the community health centers. So those are just some of the things that um, we are doing in Hawaii to help um, advance good nutrition and physical activity. And I just want to now turn it over to you to see if you have any comments or questions for the undersecretary. Okay, there, yes, Michael. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Fine, the show director of the Department of Health from Rhode Island. Um, though we don't have SNAP, we are, we, we worry a lot about sugar sweetened beverages um, and have done, have participated in some discussions about SNAP restriction. Um, we've watched the, uh, the application from New York um, and wonder if that's a realistic hope or an unrealistic one, the hope being uh, being able to find a way to restrict SNAP and certainly uh, restrict sugar-sweetened beverages. Thanks. Thank you. It's, um, it's not a hopeful one for me, let me put it that way. Uh, I... And here's my concern. We have something called the Healthy Eating Index that is devised by the staff in the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, which I oversee that as well. That's the source of the dietary guidelines. 
every six to seven years they do what's called a healthy eating in index assessment on folks in the country. If we fully abided by all of the nutrition requirements and the activity requirements into the diet, in the dietary guidelines, we would get a score of 100. Americans get a score of 58. 58, the richest people in the country, 58. SNAP recipients get a score of 52. So it is marginally less, but only marginally so. So what I have said to places like New York, if you really want to, if you really want to attack certain food groups and let's say increase taxes on them as a way of dissuading, I'm mindful of what we did in the tobacco wars. I would be very supportive of that because it applies to everybody, even though you can make a case, as some people tried to at that time, that it had a, a more a deeper effect on lower-income people. I would be supportive of using SNAP to pay some of that tax, to, to penalize people financially. But I'm not supportive of just picking out, starting to pick out certain foods. One, there are about 60,000 food products in the typical supermarket. There are something like 300,000 barcodes. But I'm also mindful from the point of view of, of Congress. Will Congress really stand up and support something like that? And the evidence I have is that they won't, uh, with few exceptions. For this reason, several years ago, Congress authorized the Centers for Disease Control, the Food and Drug Administration, the Food and Nutrition Service, my agency, and the Federal Trade Commission to develop voluntary guidelines to be recommended to industry on the advertising of foods to children age 12 or younger. And as that work progressed, industry ran up to Capitol Hill and each of our four agencies, including our own, got a letter signed by 130 Congress people and senators saying, cease and desist. We don't want you doing this. And we only got a letter supporting what we're doing from three people, Senator Harkins, Senator Sherrod Brown, and Congresswoman DeLauro. So when it came right down to it, uh, it was, and these were voluntary. So I said, you know what? To me, that's very powerful evidence. Why would I make the poorest people in the country do something that they're unwilling to apply across the board? Now, on a more hopeful, constructive side, I want you to know we're in the midst of a, of a, a very expensive project that's being evaluated by APT Associates up in western Massachusetts in the Springfield area of Massachusetts where we're matching 6,500 SNAP households where we are giving them additional benefits in effect or discounting uh, the, the subtraction from the SNAP benefits when they buy fruits and vegetables. And we're, we're comparing that with 6,500 demographically matched uh, uh, SNAP recipients in the same area uh, to see and that, that the experiment itself will end at the end of this calendar year. So we're looking forward to see the data from that to see if there are ways we can incent people to eat healthier. My other reason on the SNAP, on, on resisting uh, limiting SNAP, is 71% of SNAP households have income as well. It may come from SSI, it may come from, from work, it may come from a variety of other s sources. So we're not up for saying, let's just make those SNAP people do what we're unwilling to do ourselves. Is it on? Yeah. Um, I put up another slide because Hawaii has a, a large military population and um, they are definitely um, in need of WIC services and as well as other USDA. And I just wondered what efforts there might be related to working more closely with the military. You mentioned about uh, fitness at the adult ages, but what about at the, the children, the, the dependent level? Well, we have... Uh we have reached out to the, we, we have a relationship right now with the Department of Defense, the Defense Logistics Agency that uh, is headquartered in uh, Philadelphia or that area. But for Indian reservations and school systems across the country in rural areas, we piggyback the procurement of fruits and vegetables uh, through the Defense Logistics Agency because they make sure that military bases across the country have access to those uh, those healthier foods. 
and we piggyback with them. We've had some discussions with, we're trying to reach out to the military because they operate a number of schools and we have been encouraging them to make sure that their schools meet the healthy U.S. schools standard, uh, standards. They must meet the new dietary guidelines, but we also have a category of something called Healthy U.S. School Challenge, which about 4,000 American schools have met, which is a higher standard, it's a voluntary standard. And uh, uh, we are encouraging the military bases to adopt that as a goal because we think it better serves, obviously, their children. Yes, we have another question. Do you want to identify yourself? Hi, Mary Selecki from Washington State. And all of us, I think, as we look at our federal partners, uh, really do appreciate the partnership with the USDA. It's our biggest federal dollar that we get that impacts so many families in our states. So maybe this is more of an offer. We're all facing the sequestration and what that's going to mean. And when we look at WIC, we look at food, but we also look at the ability to deliver services in the community. So as you have to face that, I think ASTO really would like to be part of those you might engage with in making those uh, tough decisions that you ha might have to make uh, and keeping us informed so we can do good planning in our states. So um, it's one of those things that we can't hide from. We have to recognize it's in front of us. I appreciate that offer, and we're definitely, because obviously the public health efforts, uh, dollar for dollar return, are, you know, one of the most effective ways to really make impact. So, appreciate that offer. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Do we have someone? I was just going to thank you. Identify yourself Sorry. Just for uh, Marionette Miller Meeks, Iowa. Uh, both uh, Secretary uh, Concanon and Loretta for bringing up the military. Our healthiest state initiative in Iowa is privately led, publicly supported. And what we're trying to do is actually get all of our stakeholders, all of our partners in collaborations, in cooperatives. And one of the resources we have, because I'm a vet, was I was approached by recruiters in our region and the military. And we're actually utilizing them. They're in school systems. They bring in Pilates, yoga, nutrition, psychologists, this whole thing all day into high schools. We've now done seven of them in Iowa. And it has been a fantastic approach, um, very well receptive. So you have partners throughout your state that can help you with this, uh, as well as your typical partners with the YMCA, the American Heart Association, American Lung Association. So look for all of those partners that can help you in both nutrition and fitness endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just also want to say a great support for all of the data that is collected by WIC. Mm -hmm. um, that's a tremendous resource for us to look at the, the health of our children. And we definitely use that. We use it in our Title V applications. So the data systems are wonderful. We need to have continued support for that. Um, but uh, thank you. Agreed. Thank you. I think we're um, just about out of time here. Um, I do want to remind people that there are th um, some documents on your table, two from the USDA and a brief on the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act of 2010, and the role of state health agencies ensuring that. Um, I'd like to thank the secretary again, Under Secretary Concanon, for coming and sharing his wisdom with us and giving us new opportunities for leadership in joint partnership. Thank so you. thank you so much. So put your hands together for him again. <laughs> so the, now the housekeeping announcement. Uh, we're going to adjourn for lunch. Um, we ask that you head out to the foyer. We have four buffet lines. Um, you'll be coming back into this room, but they need to refresh. So go out, get your plates. The hotel staff will refresh the rooms, take your um, personal materials with you, um, bring it back in with lunch, and then we'll have some casual networking time, and then we'll begin our next session at 1240. So enjoy your lunch. Thank you.